Hi, folks. This is Rick Doc Walker, the DOC. This is John Kime, and you're listening to the Mess Hall with Rally Captain and Tailgate Ted. What's going on, Rally? No sunglasses this week, man. No, no. This the, the the shine has passed us, brother. Now it's time to get to work. The 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 glitz and the glam is over with. Let's get to work. And with I that hear being you there, said, man. with that being said, let's get it. It definitely is time to get to work. But before we jump into it, I want to mention something that a majority of our listeners probably already know. Mike Sellers, fullback for this team, probably one of the, I mean, the greatest fullback I can remember, Caveman. Yeah. I remember seeing him just on the sideline, the different games recently. And I just want to ran into him in Atlanta when we were down there. But regardless, Big Mike ain't doing too well. And his <laughs> wife put a GoFundMe out there. Those of you wondering what it is, I tweeted it out there. John, Con like a bunch of the beat reporters tweeted it out there. We'll put it on the DMV Mess Hall page as well. Mike's in the hospital, and he's not doing too well. He's not able to really provide for his family. Mm -hmm. And earlier on today, it was a twenty-seven thousand. It's now at forty-two thousand dollars. Every little bit helps, whether it's a dollar, whether it's five dollars, or whether you know it's a couple thousand dollars. If you guys can. You know, please think about donating to the GoFundMe. If you can't, hey, just send the family some prayers because Mike needs it and he's meant a lot to this franchise and this fan base. And we want to make sure we start the show off just by, you know, mentioning that. Definitely, man. And, and, and we cheered for him on the field. So now we've got to do our part and cheer for him off the field with this GoFundMe. And like you said, Every little bit helps, and uh, it's to the point where his wife, she isn't working now. She's pretty much relying upon these donations and everybody to help out as as much as they possibly can. She now is the one who's taking over the family. So anything can you guys can do, please help out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it, and. You know, definitely sending prayers out to Mike and the family and all of his teammates and everyone that knows him because it's just it's not an easy thing to see this guy that we all watched on the field, just this big bruiser from Walla Walla Community College. It always cracked me up when Walla they would Walla. do uh, <laughs> prime time intros on like Monday Night Football and everything else. And you got these guys saying they're from the U or they're from the Ohio State and you got big Mike on there saying, Walla Walla Community College. It is just, you know, that was just Mike's personality. And then mm -hmm. just trying to represent and now seeing the picture on the, you know, the GoFundMe just kind of tugs at the heartstrings. But we're going to try and, you know, obviously there's no easy transition from that. But how was your holiday weekend, man? You get into anything, get a little long weekend, or were you stuck working OT? No, I, I, I did a lot of resting, bro. I mean, <laughs> what comes along with OT is rest. So <laughs> <laughs> you got to do that. It, but I, I got to keep it going because like I tell everyone what's being paid for now is next year's tickets, not this year, next year. I'm always a year ahead. So you got to do that to, to keep it going. Hey, I hear you, man. It's so, uh, I mean, I wish I was getting some extra OT because the missus and I went to the beach and we went to the uh -huh. and uh, we are not buying a boat. But, hey, you know, window shop, take a look at some stuff. I'm close to getting her to agree to a jet ski. I don't know if she's going to actually buy off on it. But, you know, you put things out there in the universe and maybe they come back and we'll see what happens. Two-seater? Uh, oh, yeah, definitely a two-seater and a little wave yeah. runner, something like that. Yeah. So, you know, just go out there and just have some fun on the ocean. But we did go watch a pickleball tournament, right? So mm, you, I'm wait, signing wait, you, up. You, you, you watched it. You didn't participate. No, I didn't participate because this. by the time I found out about it, it already closed. So I'm participating okay. in one in May in D.C. And we're, I just signed up today for the Ocean City Pickleball Tournament in May. So hopefully it'll be a good time. Got a chance to go up there and scope out the competition. You know, maybe pulling a Bill Belichick and recording some people, you know, just trying to see what they do. But uh, looking forward to getting out there and I've been on a spending spree, buying stuff, getting ready for the tournament. So I can mm, we can mm. definitely use some more sponsors to sign up for the show to help put some money back in the coffers because <laughs> I am going broke buying pickleball stuff. 
So, so explain pickleball exactly. Is it is it basically like tennis where, you know, obviously if the person doesn't put the ball back over the net, you get a point, correct? Or how does it so work? You only get a point when it's your serve, but mm -hmm. you can fit four pickleball courts on one tennis court. So the dimensions are smaller. You're not running around as much. You're still moving around. Don't get me wrong, mm -hmm. but you're not running around as much. And a lot of people get confused because they've got this area in the front that's called the kitchen that you're not allowed, that people think you're not allowed to step in. You're allowed to step in it. You just can't hit the ball out of the air in it. So that's like the one main difference. But imagine if a tennis and ping pong had a baby and a wiffle ball came out, right? That's basically the ball you use is kind of like a wiffle ball that has holes in it that are circular. So mm -hmm. it doesn't go as fast as a tennis ball, but it's still kind of the same motions and everything else. And these rackets are not cheap, man. There's one racket I really want to buy. It's 330 bucks. And I just bought one that's 250 bucks. That's yeah. a game ticket, bro. Yeah, man. I know. I mean, that's uh, one of your front row seats to like a, a Giants game or something, man. So yeah, dang. But we'll, we'll see how it goes, man. You know, I'm, I'm enjoying it after we record today. For those wondering, it's Wednesday, the 21st. I'm, I'm going to go hit the courts out, hopefully while the sun's still up for a little bit and go catch up on it. And I know some of our listeners have hit me up. Hey, if you guys want to play. I'm always down. And one of these days, we'll get Rally out there. Maybe he can uh, wear that chain to slow him down so we can get some more shots on him. <laughs> yeah, because it's not very aerodynamic. <laughs> it doesn't look like it. I just remember some of the players saying, no, nah, I'm not putting that on. It's too heavy. <laughs> and it's not heavy at all, see? And that's where they go wrong. This year, the chain is coming back out, and more players are going to don the chain. That's the goal. Hey, looks can be deceiving, man. I mean, there's just... There's a lot more to it. And speaking of which, the looks of this commander's coaching staff, we talked about it last show. If you guys didn't catch it, go back, listen to it. You know, we've got high hopes for this staff. And now that they've finally selected the staff, they have three holdovers from 2023. One of the guys that's on right now is a former head coach among the coordinators and other position coaches. There's another former head coach. There are 11 position coaches and assistants that have more than 100 years of combined service coaching at the pro level, not talking high school, at the pro level. And more than half of them have served as coordinators. And almost half of these actual coaches have actually played the game as well. It's like, have you ever had that boss that has never walked a mile in your shoes? Hmm. Okay. So, I mean, I'm, personally, I'm, I'm, I have. I'm tracking, I'm tracking what you're saying. Right. So it's like, I don't respect that guy that's trying to tell me what to do if he's never done it before. Mm -hmm. Right. And oh, yeah. You've got guys that are trying to tell these football players, I mean, hey, you know, the, the little, the little pipsqueak from the Dolphins. To me, what, Mike McDaniel, I think is his name. I don't have hard knocks. So, you know, I, I just watched it one time when they played us and it didn't go out too well. But to me, it's hard to take that guy serious if I'm a, you know, a six foot seven, six foot eight defensive lineman, knowing that that guy has never played a down football before. Don't and, forget to add, don't forget to add young millionaire on top of that. So, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you've got half of this coaching staff, like Ken Norton Jr., three time Super Bowl champion. Granted, with one of the worst teams out there, but hey, three time Super Bowl champ. You know, you've got a lot of these guys that have played this game before, and these coaches that have experience. And the other part that I love about this new staff is we're not the commanders or the, the Cowboys of the East or mm -hmm. whatever, because there's no nepotism going on here. There's no bringing people on just because you coach with them before they're right. pulling coaches from all over the NFL and all over college to try and get different personalities and different mindsets. And they're basically building almost like this Benetton ad for a coaching staff to try and bring in people from different facets of the NFL mm -hmm. with different yeah. philosophies to see what's going to work. And that's why I'm so excited, man. Love it. Love it. Love it. And this is what we have needed for a long time. And like you said, the Benetton of America, I mean, all kinds of colors, race, creeds. I love it. And that way everyone can bring in their own expertise and say, hey, well, what do you think about it? I think we should try it this way. Well, well, this player, I believe, 
could mesh or mold us better this way. Well, let's give it a shot. I can't wait. I can't either, man. And last week, Cliff Kingsbury and Joe Witt had their press conferences on Thursday. So we didn't get a chance to talk about it on the show. So we've got some clips for you guys. So you can kind of go back and hear what they had to say. Kingsbury, not as energetic and interesting as Witt. Maybe that's just because he's been a head coach before and didn't really want to give bulletin board material or kind of go viral. But, you know, we'll get into it. Kingsbury actually talked about the difference of being a head coach versus an offensive coordinator. And this is what he had to say. Back in the NFL now, um, but going to be a coordinator instead of a head coach. What are some of the differences that, that will be in those two different roles? And are you looking forward to some of those differences? Being able to just focus on the offense um, will be great. You know, Dan has, has a bunch on his plate. I've, I've sat in that seat, and so you're dealing with the entire picture. Uh, with me now, it's, it's focusing on that group and, and trying to maximize who we are personnel-wise, coaching staff-wise, and being the best we can um, just in that area. So to be able to back up and, and do that again is exciting, to put all that focus just into that um, and ready to get to work. What I love about that is everyone has basically just one job and not two or three trying to stretch themselves too thin as we know the previous regime did. You just got one job. That's all you got to focus on. Everyone has pretty much been around the world and they're not trying to reinvent the wheel. And I honestly believe when you just got one job to focus on, you can just do that. Let everybody else worry about their niche, if you will. The, the past regime loved position flex, and it's a little bit different because we were talking about players. But at a certain point, we just wanted a stud at the one thing they did and just do it at a Pro Bowl level. And Kingsbury, being a head coach before, knows how thin you get stretched. Campbell, no, sorry, Quinn, being head coach before in Atlanta, knew how thin he got stretched, and he mm -hmm. didn't have time to focus on stuff. A lot of people didn't want a offensive young mind to just be our coordinator because then they were worried that he was going to get poached. Rally and I talked about it. like it's a good problem to have if this guy gets poached. I don't have the feeling that Kingsbury is itching to go back to be a head coach. I don't feel that he is just eager and ready to run his own team again because it didn't go as well as he wanted to in Arizona. And he knows he's a good head offensive coordinator, and he just wants to be that. And yeah. there was some controversy because he was supposed to be with the Raiders as their OC, and then Magic Johnson reportedly swept in at the last minute and <laughs> wined and dined him. And Kingsbury specifically dodged those questions and didn't want to talk about it. And Antonio Pierce was on a podcast talking about how, you know, until the – Inks dry on that paper. You know, you never know what's going to happen in the NFL, not for long. But mm -hmm. all that matters is he's here with us now. And yeah. he's just focused on the offense. He's focused on improving where we have just sorely lacked. And this is actually what Kingsbury had to say about what type of offense he plans on running. Everybody talks about the air raid offense. How has that evolved for you from the time you're in college to Arizona to now? Yeah. At Texas Tech, um, University of Houston, you know, we had Case Keno and Patrick Mahomes, so we were throwing it a ton, and it was spread offense just like a lot of those are. You get in the NFL, you, you learn the nature of that game and, and the different personnel groups and um, the matchups and, and things like that, and I'm not sure where we were on, on pass percentage my last three years there, but I, I know it wasn't at the top. Um, so we want to be balanced. We want to be able to run the football and, and uh, play action pass and um, really do whatever it takes to win. But the air raid deal is, is – you know, I'm honored to be a part of that because it was Mike Leach, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for him, but uh, I wouldn't categorize anything we do under that name. So we've all been speculating until Kingsbury actually just put it out there, what type of offense is he going to run? And he said it's not going to be an air raid style offense. It's not going to be an offense that Drake May is familiar with from his time in North Carolina. Same thing with Sam Howell in that air raid style. He wants to be balanced. He wants to have that attack. And we did not have that last year with Eric Bieniemy. There was zero balance. Fact yeah. that we passed the ball as many times as we did. So for me, it's refreshing to hear that he wants to have that. Because I don't know if you remember early on when Bieniemy came on board and Rivera, 
were talking, they wanted to have, I want to say it was a three to one run to pass ratio. And everyone just threw a fit because that's not the modern NFL. And then come out, we come to find out that it was more so a one to three pass ratio, maybe yeah. one to four, you know, pass to run ratio. But hearing that, he plans on being a balanced attack to me is just going to play to the strengths of whatever young quarterback you have running this out. Well, I'm not going to hold my breath on anything that anyone says just yet, Ted, until I see it, because as you said, we've heard it before. So uh, this could be also a situation to where he's trying to throw people off to possibly dictate what quarterback that he wants, because he knows that everyone's listening. So I'm more of a type of a guy that's just going to let this thing play out and just see where it lands, because you're not going to get me caught up with, I'm not going to run this or I'm not going to do that until preseason and actually even the first game because we know that they will uh, disguise everything in preseason until that first game. So I'm more of a don't talk about it. Just go out there and do it and let me see it, and then I'll be able to make my mind up. No, I hear you. and You're 100% spot on. We're not going to see anything in preseason. They never show the real play. Mm -hmm. So I am looking forward to seeing it in training camp. I plan oh, yeah. on being at every single practice and training camp because wow, you no, know, I mean, hey, I was there for pretty much all of them last year, and now we got a new coaching staff. I want to see what these guys can do, and mm -hmm. I mean, some of these guys made me want to run through a freaking wall right now during the press conferences. But the enemy's offense at goal line during training camp couldn't get in; they couldn't run the ball, they couldn't do anything. I want to see if Kingsbury's offense can do that, or is he going to be all cutesy about it and go shotgun? I mean, it's it's going to be mm -hmm. interesting to me, but. <laughs> I think the most important thing this upcoming season, now that we have a GM and we got a head coach and we got a staff, is who's going to be QB? Is it going to be Sam? Is it going to be a vet like Kirk Cousins or someone else coming in here? This is actually what Kingsbury had to say about what type of quarterback he wants. I guess when you look at today's NFL, what type of quarterback, like the ideal fit, the characteristics, the traits that you want to work with here in Washington? Uh, the Chiefs quarterback? That'd help. <laughs> No, um, I do think the game, as you can see, you watch those guys, Brock and him at the end, like when the money's on the table, you got to be able to make some plays um, with your feet, move around enough to escape a bad play. And it doesn't mean you got to run like Lamar or Kyler Murray, but you better be able to move a little bit and um, buy yourself some time because the, the D-line, the rushes, the defense these days are so good. And, and then the intangibles, you know, you want that player to be the hardest worker on your team. You want him to lead those guys. Um, each and every day when, when he shows up in the building, you want him to lift the building up, and um, that's why those guys make the type of money they do. I don't think we can afford to go with a traditional drop-back pocket passer, and I don't think that's what's successful in the NFL now. I mean, yeah. it'd be nice if we could have Patrick Mahomes. And I know you listen to B. Mitch and Finley. It, it cracks me up whenever J.P. Finley asks Andy Reid if he'll trade us Patrick Mahomes. I mean, it, it's obviously just a joke knowing it's never going to happen. But, you know, everybody wants a Patrick Mahomes. But to me, mm -hmm. to have someone that can create on the fly and do something like that is what we need. And we saw Purdy do that against the Lions when he was playing. He didn't do it as much against the Chiefs for whatever reason, maybe because Kansas City had a spy on him or we're just kind of expecting it. But that's why I want Jaden Daniels here as our next quarterback at number two. I'm not going to mm -hmm. lie, though, because when I was at the beach, I got a $5 FanDuel uh, bet for free because of the Super Bowl, right? Uh -huh. So I put odds on the number two pick of the NFL draft being Caleb Williams because I think I got it at plus 3,000 or something like that because everyone's thinking Caleb's going to go one. Number one, yeah. So if you're giving me $5 free, I'm not going to bet it on, like, a sure bet. You know, it's not coming out of my pocket. So yeah. we'll see what happens. And I don't want Caleb. But, hey, if it happens, then my bank account will be richer and I'm close to getting that new paddle and maybe a jet ski. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what do you I, do? I don't – well, okay, I'm one of the guys that will tell you if you're in the top three and obviously the top two because we have the second pick, I'm going to take you whoever you are. Obviously, if you have made it that high, you've shown enough – to be able to be picked that high. So I'm not going to say 
that it's got to be this guy, that guy, because at the end of the day, who knows what they what they want? So just let him be able to run the offense that you guys are looking for, and I'll be happy. And then spread out from there. So once we once we get whoever it is, I'm riding with them. How about that? No, I'm right there with you. I'm riding with them. And we've been talking about pro football focus all year long. I mean, they've got their big board. They got Caleb as number one, right? Mm -hmm. They've got Marvin Harrison Jr. number two. And you've got some of this fan base that want us to take Marvin Harrison Jr. at number two. I, I personally don't want us to do that. I don't want another wide receiver at that point because who's going to block and who's going to throw him the ball. So yeah. the second quarterback they got going off the board is Drake May. And the third quarterback that got going off, let's see here, is actually, damn, I am surprised he is this far down on the list. This can't be right. Where Jaden Daniels, they got him ranked PFF at 22 on here. So, really? yeah, out of their big board. So it it's interesting to see what they say. But when they're talking about Washington's team needs here, putting this inside, I mean, I've, it's quarterback and it's offense, offensive tackle. And a lot of people want us to take Joe Walt from Notre Dame. And he's projected number six on their big board. I just... For me, you never know when you're going to pick this high and you don't want to have to mortgage a farm like we did with Robert to get mm -hmm. this high again. So that's why I want a QB. And whether it's Drake or Caleb or Jaden, I'm going to roll with it. And if it is a big boy, then, hey, I ain't going to be happy, but it's still our team. And I still got their back regardless. I just hope that we get someone like a vet to come in here because I'm not exactly excited about the free agent quarterbacks that are out there. I don't want Kirk to come back for another run and then no, hold us hostage I, yeah. and make the wrong play when crunch time comes. I don't want that. So basically we got the second pick and after the second pick, what's our next number? After you know we get offhand. the second pick offhand, I don't know, but I can tell you in a second. Uh, yeah, because yeah. that's, that's going to truly dictate I believe what we will do. Uh, I, I believe that it could be a situation to where, yeah, if Caleb goes number one and the number three who's behind us may need something that uh, we can bargain for. So we may, I can see us maybe saying, you know what, give us this and we'll take that for what we really want because we, we still don't really know what offense it's going to be ran. We just don't. No, but we know what holes we have. We we need help at right. quarterback. Yes. We need help at left tackle. We need help at left guard. We need help at center. I mean, I'm, we need a tight end, a real actual tight end that'll be out there. No offense to John Bates, but, you know, the offense needs a lot of help. Rivera did us really no help at all just by drafting the players he's drafted over the years and not focusing on the offense. And our next next pick is 36 i believe so you know they've second got 36 some room. wow yeah. second okay. at 36 and then the second pick at uh, round two at 40 so i mean we have a lot of draft capital and we'll see what happens and, but my thing is you can get a stud offensive lineman in the second round they don't got to be a first round guy mm -hmm. it's hard to find a stud quarterback in the second round and none of these quarterbacks are a lock you could definitely get it wrong, but to me, you got to keep swinging until you hit it out of the park, and we haven't oh, been yeah. swinging at all. Well, no, well, we <laughs> we swung, but uh, it was a swing and a miss, if you will. So I don't, and that's what I don't want. I don't want us to have to go backwards with a swing and a miss, or and I, that's just we can't do it. So this more so than this draft more so than anything else we've got to hit and hit hard and hit right and i believe the people the people the powers that be uh and the people in charge will be able to make those right calls and and we're putting a lot of faith in them because they've done it before you know like you said there, there's over a hundred years of experience so the big board room that we're going to have those guys are going to be willing and dealing, and I believe that they're going to get 
the person that we truly need. It may not be who the fans want. It may not be, but it's going to be something that the team needs. So do you want team needs or do you want fan wants? That's the question. I've been turning the radio off when the junkies are taking calls about the draft because it drives me crazy because you got people <laughs> out there that still want us to roll with Sam Howell. And I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. I just, he does not have what it takes for me, regardless if he was in the enemy system or Kingsbury system, I just feel that he hit a wall and he, you know, people keep talking about he, how he was projected to be a first round pick. Well, he wasn't, he was passed up. He went in the fifth. I mean, we got a chance to actually get a stud right now and I want to get that stud and who knows, mm -hmm. maybe he might not pan out to be that stud. Maybe it'll be a dud. Like what was his face? Uh, the guy that they drafted last time in San Fran that they had to get rid of. I can't remember his name right now. Oh, he's playing for Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll think yeah. of it later. But, you yeah. know, regardless, it just, you got to try. And you hope that Kingsbury has been a quarterback whisperer. I mean, he knows what good quarterback play looks like. I mean, Patrick Mahomes talked about him during the Super Bowl press week and how, you know, he wouldn't be the player he is without Kingsbury. So you got to think that. All that experience in that room and in that front office from the draft perspective, they're going to collectively come together. I feel that in the past, Ron Rivera was like uh, Kevin Costner in draft day, where he took this guy no matter what, right? Hmm. The, the guy that was should have been selected in the third round, he took him no matter what, right? I don't think that this staff is going to do that. And this is actually what Kingsbury had to say about learning from being a head coach in the NFL and in college. Uh, Coach, we heard from Dan Quinn when he first came in. He wanted to talk about all of the things that he learned from his job in Atlanta. I wonder what it is that you've learned that you're bringing here from your previous head coaching experience and what you've taken away from USC. Yeah, I think, like I mentioned earlier, first and foremost, uh, consistency and approach, and, and then the standard's got to be the standard no matter what, no matter who you bring in, what it looks like, how the season's going. Uh, you can't let that dictate, you know, how you approach um, the team and, and how you coach. And, and then the USC deal, um, more than anything, just re-energized me being around those young players and, and those kids that were excited to play the game, even though they're getting paid now, which is a little bit different. Um, th they just have a real thirst for knowledge and, and want to learn. That's partly why I don't think we're going to go bet. And with Peter saying that build to the draft and supplement through free agency. I mean, Kingsbury was recently just working with Caleb out at USC. And we all know all the rumors, oh, they brought him here so we could get Caleb. Guess what? It's not up to that. It's up to what the Bears want to do at one. Mm, and yeah. people that want us to trade up one pick, you guys are insane. Uh, there is zero chance we should mortgage the farm to go one spot. And if they do that, then I'll see what I look like in purple. But that, that just makes no sense at all. No, I, I wouldn't agree with it. But at the same time, hey, I don't get paid millions of dollars to make these type of picks. And it goes back to team needs versus fan wants. So uh, I've, I will sit back and have my popcorn ready and just take it all in. And once again, this is like the, one of the best times for the team as well as the fan base. Sit back and just try to relax and let it unfold because and get prepared for this ride because it's going to be a ride. It, and I can't wait, man. I can't wait till the draft comes. Not, not even the combine and all that stuff. I just can't wait till the draft comes and then we know who we got and then we get a chance to see these rooks. I mean, mm -hmm. when they offer the season ticket holder day so we can go to a rookie minicamp and all that stuff, I just want to see these kids throwing the ball around. I want to see – I mean, great, they're not really going to be hitting each other, but I just want to see these guys out there and see what they do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, I mean, there's stuff that they're not going to show, and obviously it's minicamp. But Kingsbury talked about what some of the key attributes – he thinks an offense needs to be successful. This is what he had to say. There, what are some of the key attributes an offense needs to have in order to be successful in this league? Yeah, first and foremost, being able to adapt to your personnel, um, do what you do best, and don't ask them to do things they can't do. And uh, we have a staff that is all in agreement on that and takes pride in that. So we're, we're going to build this thing together and be collaborative 
as we put it together and just make sure we're putting our guys in the best situation possible. Um, you got to be able to, you know, run the football in four minutes and you got to be able to throw it in two minutes. And you saw that game come down to it a couple times the other night. Um, that's how these games come down to. And, and so um, more than anything, just making sure we're putting those position, those players in a position to be successful. Adapt to your personnel, not fit a square peg into a round hole. I mean, and I get it. This is all lip service right now. We'll, we'll see how that actually goes when it comes. But yeah. To me, this is the complete opposite of what we had with the enemy. He made his personnel adapt to him versus mm -hmm. adapting to the strengths of the people that he had. I mean, this offensive line was built to run the football, but yet we ran it, I want to say, the second fewest in the league this year, if not the fewest. So knowing what we have and evaluating this roster or crafting this roster to be what you need it to be is exactly what has to happen this offseason. Ted, you said a mouthful, and the fact is that the enemy walked in here saying that we were going to run the ball, and it just didn't happen. So right now it's all lip service, and you just don't know what – they're thinking, come on, let's hurry up and get to May. <laughs> let's go hurry up and get to April because it's coming, and and we will see. I can't wait, bro. That's all I'm going to yeah. tell you, man. I, and I sound like a broken record, but that's where I am with this. Well, one guy that can't wait is Joe Witt. And if you guys didn't catch his press conference, I mean, he definitely got me fired up. You sent me a text message commenting about it and i hadn't had a chance to listen to it i was actually mm -hmm. getting some work in at that point and i went back and listened to it yesterday and then again today cutting these clips up and i'm surprised that he hasn't had a shot yet i mean kingsbury's definitely had shots at this joe witt hasn't and it kind of surprised me and this is actually what witt had to say about why he thinks he's finally ready for this challenge but why do you feel maybe you're ready for this now <laughs> that's a funny question to me uh, i've been coaching in the league for 18 years OK, I see a lot of these young guys get opportunities years, years, years prior and nobody really questioned them. You know what I'm saying? Um, I've been ready and just the opportunity now has come with Coach Quinn. But a question of my ability to call defense, to structure a defense, uh, to do that, I have full, full confidence in that. I mean, the guy said that his dream was to coach the Dallas Cowboys and he came here. And obviously, we ain't the Dallas Cowboys, but, you know, he had a chance to potentially stick around there, maybe get promoted, and he wanted to follow Dan Quinn. He wanted to come here. They worked together in Atlanta. They worked together in Dallas, and they had a ton of success. And this is actually what he had to say about why they've been successful together. Uh, you and Coach Quinn, you were together in Atlanta, together in Dallas. Now you're here in Washington. What's allowed the relationship to be successful between you and Coach Quinn? Um, first thing, it's going to sound sort of corny, but he's he's just the best human being that I've probably been around in, in football. Okay, he's take the football coach out of it. He's a really good person. When I get to Atlanta, um, and I have to move my family down, he writes handwritten notes to my kids. I never had a head coach do that. All right, my son was struggling in football um, with a with a, a certain bl um, block uh, blitzing scheme, and he takes time out of his day to put a video of Michael Parsons rushing on a tackle from practice to help my son um, rush on the tackle in, 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 in his practice. That's what type of dude this is, all right? So I'm all in with him, 100%. Um, and then as a coach, he allows you to be creative. He, he wants the, you to think outside of the box. He wants you to go uh, – going into last year, I mean this offseason – last two years in a row prior to that, 21 and 22, we were the number one team in the league for two years in a row in turnovers. You know what the first thing he told me to do? Joe, how can we get more turnovers? I want you to research. How do you get more turnovers? Because the ball is life. All right, so he's always trying to make you level up and, and, and give you the ability to think outside of the box and do it. He doesn't want to just say, hey, that's the way we've already done it. And I, I'm a believer, too. If, if, I, if I ask you a question and you say, hey, that's the way I've always done it, it can be changed, all right, because that's not a very good answer. 
All right. So we're going to always try to find a way to get better and level up and think outside of the box because that's what these offenses are doing. All right. The, what the, these motions and these shifts and these formations that these guys are, are, are doing that's coming from the college game. If you don't think it's outside of the box, you will you will fall short. And so we will be um, innovative in that way. Mm-mm. Man, see, he just had me ready to dog on run through a brick wall. The goosebumps came up in my arms, but I, I, I still got to hold myself back. I've, I've got to temper myself because it doesn't mean anything just yet. So I don't know Let's, if I agree with you, man. I mean, Dallas uh, had a top 10 defense, right? They, they did. They were the worst defense in the but, league. But they what? also they also drafted the right personnel and and I'm just I'm just not sold yet. I'm so, wait wait. I'm sold that yes that everyone has the acumen that's needed, but I'm not sold just yet until we get these pieces to this puzzle that we need. And we know that that could possibly take very, very rarely will it hit the first year. We know it's going to hit year 2. Definitely year three. Maybe year three. Yeah. 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 I mean, so, just so, be realistic. It's it's a yeah. six year deal. These coordinators got three year contracts. It's very yeah. rare that you get what the Houston Texans did, where they you know, right. go back at that yeah. point. Well, when you think about it, Houston had a bunch of losing seasons as well to be able to get those picks that they needed to to build and mold that defense. So I'm not saying that I'm going to another team or anything. I'm just saying that I'm just slowing my roll and. I want to be wild. That's where I am right now. And I feel as though it can happen. I feel it will happen. Just, I am just taking my baby steps. So allow me to take my baby steps. Oh, I yes, got you. I got I'm, you. I'm, still yeah. a, I'm still a captain. I'm still rah-rah. I'm not going anywhere. But I just want to be able to take my baby steps. And I want to be able to embrace all of this. To me, from a personality perspective, he couldn't be more opposite of Ron Rivera and he couldn't be more opposite of Jack Del Rio. I feel that this guy is innovative and wants to upset the apple cart. He wants to find ways to create matchups. I mean, the stuff that he was doing out there with Michael Parsons, just lining him up all over the place. We talked about in a previous pod, maybe Jamin Davis can have a resurgence. Maybe they can actually put him in a position where he needs to be. And, mm -hmm fact that you know dan quinn went that extra step to write those handwritten notes for his family when they're coming to move out there that's why you heard all of these other players and coaches that have met that man just rave about him and to me you fight for a coach like that you fight for a person like that and you give the extra people like jack del rio and his dust up comments and other stuff like that, you do the bare minimum. You don't do the extra that's needed to be done because I don't feel that they're doing that either. And I'm yeah. excited because I feel that these guys are hungry. I never felt that Ron was hungry. I felt that he was fat, lazy, and happy because he got a job that no one else wanted. I never felt that Del Rio was hungry, right? Or Scott Turner was hungry. I feel that now with these guys. And this is actually what Witt had to say about creating matchup problems, which I'm hoping he's going to do for some of the guys that we have on this roster. Um, last year with the Cowboys, obviously, Michael Parsons is a special player, mm -hmm. but you moved him around the defense a lot and kind of got creative a little bit with him. How much of that is a staple of kind of the type of defense you want to bring to Washington and, and – kind of creating creating matchups for players like that? Well, you know, Micah is a unicorn, so he, he's a little bit different, but it doesn't take a unicorn to, to be creative, all right? Um, I like to think of our defense, um, and even going back to Green Bay, as sort of a positionalist defense because – and just follow me with this here. Um, you can take a Micah Parsons and, and put him down – put him at linebacker in the four-down spacing, or you can put him at a um, in and five-down spacing, okay? Or you could take a J. Ron Curse, who we've had as a safety, a Buffalo nickel um, – and then you can put him in a linebacker type spacing. It changes the ID for the centers when you do that. It changes that point and, and depending on is Micah out there with four bigs or how they're going to consider him. Are they going to put the back on him? If, good luck if you want to. All right. Are you going to slide to him? So 
Um, we have some guys here that that we feel that can create some real matchup problems with people. And um, we're gonna you're gonna hear me talk about feed the studs. Uh, you got to earn your right to be a stud so we can design things particularly for you. Uh, and we will get creative with especially our, our pressure package of how we get to the quarterback and who we send to the quarterback, uh, depending on um, how they prove it on the practice field. Mm. See, now that makes a lot of sense. Uh, at, that changes things because at this point, this is kind of getting down to the Marines, if you will. What's the Marine slogan? Earned, never given. And that's what I want to be able to hear. The fact is, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of competition. Oh, yeah. And, you, and you're just not going to get it because you are you. Uh-uh. Yeah. What's that, the bull in the ring? You know what I mean? Uh, oh, yeah. Whatever you got to do to to prove yourself is going to be the guy who will be the starter. The players that complained uh, about it being tough last year. They don't know what they're in for this year. You you don't just get your starting spot because you were drafted this high or because you're making this much money. If anything, I mean, Brock Purdy is a perfect example of that, where Peters came from. You know, Mm -hmm. they had a bunch of people ahead of him that probably should have been starting, but just because. It it drove me crazy years past just because a guy was drafted – I don't know how many times we saw guys drafted in later rounds that showed more promise than the guy that was drafted higher, but the past Mm -hmm. regimes, I'm not just talking about Rivera, but even before then the past regimes played the other kid because they had more draft capital. And I don't feel that that's what's going to happen here. Not with these guys. You got to earn it. You got to prove you that you're a stud and then they'll give you more to do. Yeah. They kept the guy on the field because they didn't want to seem as though they wasted that pick. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, look I, at I told, Cheeseman staying on the roster as long as he freaking did. Yeah. But yeah. I'm curious, everyone's been curious what type of defense that they're going to be running here considering, you know, what they ran in Atlanta, what they ran in Dallas. This is what Witt had to say. We obviously got to watch the defense uh, that you and Dan uh, works on in Dallas. People want to kind of know what, what does that mean now? What are you bringing here? Does that you already have a thought in mind of what exactly it'll be, or do you need to see more of, hey, who's on this team, and then adjust to that? Uh, one thing I could tell you, um, like Dan said, is more about the play style than anything else, okay? We're going to get that right first. And, and one thing that we're going to do, we're going to be a run and hit defense, all right? Uh, we're going to run, and, and, and I just told this to our staff, the defensive staff, we had our first staff meeting. Um, the way that we live is not for everybody. OK, it's not all right because we're going to run and put our bodies on people in a violent manner. All right. And so we're going to get that play style right first. All right. And then the structure of what we do um, don't really don't really doesn't really matter. You know, three, four, four, three. Um, everybody really plays the same coverages to some point. All right. Uh, the structure doesn't matter to me. The main thing that matters to me is are we going to be arriving violently? All right, and we're going to turn the ball over. All right, we're going to make sure we disrupt these quarterbacks. Mm. I know you're not excited yet, but man, I mean, sorry, arriving violently. Like we have not had that since London Fletcher was on that field. I, I cannot think of a time where our defenses dictated anything to anybody. And if that's the style he's going to, we we mentioned it last season. What the hell is our identity? We haven't had an identity for so freaking long here as a team. And if that's the identity they're going to bring, I'm all in. I'm I'm definitely all in. And that just tells me that what you're looking for may not be here right now. Oh, yeah. So you're going to have to draft what you're looking for. And that tells me that the future is very bright because you're going to bring a guy – who is with that particular skill set who you know is going to knock people around. Like I said, man, my popcorn is ready, and I cannot wait for the main show to start. And what they're looking for might be here. It might be in these players, but they've got to teach them how to do it. They've got to teach them how to find it. And he said something in this press conference to me that spoke volumes 
just about the coach he is and his patience. And it gives me faith that maybe some of these guys that have seemed like a bust, like an Emmanuel Forbes, like a Jamin Davis, some of these guys where we expected more, it makes me feel that they're going to do what they need to do as a coaching staff to get out of these players what they actually need. And this is what Witt had to say about how he deals with players that are struggling. And it, it's very obvious, like your your brain works works very quickly when you're thinking about NFL defenses. When you have a player that kind of struggles with maybe adapting to a check or a call or something, you're you're trying to teach them. What's what's something that you're going to do to try to 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 bring that that gap together? Well, if they're struggling, um, that's our fault. Okay, um, so um, as coaches, we we take this the the brunt of the. Um, the learning to make sure that once they go out there, they're playing fast. So um, I'm dyslexic, okay? So I I always talk about um, coaching the creative learner. And, and if a guy struggles to learn at times, that is our job to make sure that we teach them in many different facets, in many different ways so that that guy can get it. All right, that's our job. That's what they pay us to what they pay us. They don't pay us all this money just to, to go in there and, and put it up on the board. And if certain guys can't get it, no, it's your job to make sure they can get it. And if a coach um, sits there and says he can't learn, he probably can't coach. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll get these guys to understand what we want them to do and do it in a, 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 a very good manner. It, it just makes me wonder what type of year would Forbes would have had if he had – these type of coaches leading him and teaching him versus what he just had versus just benching his ass and treating him the way that they did this past season and having him not get any time. Mm -hmm. Cause I did not hear our staff say that, that, you know, it's our fault. No. And, and very rarely will you hear that. So I, I love the fact that there will be accountability on both sides, on the player side as well as the coach side, because as, as you said, you just don't hear it. And it's refreshing. And I, I chalk it up again. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> but to me, the big takeaway from that clip is everyone learns in different ways, right? And definitely maybe the way you're teaching that player this technique or how to take this play or how to react when you see this, when the offense is doing that, it doesn't work that way. And with this Benetton like ad of coaches that we have here, this hodgepodge, these hundred years of experience, these guys all have different ways of looking at things, different point of views. And maybe they'll teach Emmanuel away because I'm, I was concerned that he would just be a flat out bust that he was brought in here to fit into Jack Del Rio's system. Del Rio's system is no longer here. It's now going to be a completely different system with wit. No, I feel that they're going to find a way to utilize this kid and his talents. And this is actually what Witt had to specifically say about Forbes. Yeah. I know earlier in your career you worked closely with Charles Woodson when yeah. he had a really good season recently, like Trayvon Diggs, Deron Bland in Dallas. Uh, when you look at the secondary here, I know Emmanuel Forbes, when he was in college, was a ball hawker, didn't quite have that exact success last year. Uh, what do you see about Forbes, maybe what you've seen so far, and maybe the potential he has, what he can do? You know, I really like Forbes when he came out. And um, and not only Forbes, I like Quan. And, you know, they have a number of guys on that back end that really, really are intriguing. And the thing that we have to do, um, that's why we brought Jason Simmons in and, and Tommy Donatell, uh, to get those guys in and to believe in the, the, the techniques that we're going to teach them and, and the um, scheme that we're going to put them in. But we have um, quality young players here. Uh, we're just ready to get to work with them. Yeah. I know you can't wait, and most of our listeners can't either. We obviously <laughs> still got we got some time, and we got yeah. – uh, a bunch more steps so they can step on that field and go there. But the key thing here is that the two guys at Quinn, his, his two lieutenants, if you will, they got a game plan and they have a vision that they want for this franchise and for this team. And for the first time in a long time, I feel that we've got the right people here to help execute that vision, whether, you know, it's Kingsbury and the offense and it's Quinn in the defense, or not Quinn in the defense, Witt in the defense. And maybe, just maybe, they can shine up and polish up some of these players and 
find facets of their game that they didn't even know that they had. Yeah. What I liked is the fact that he didn't overcomplicate his answers. He gave you a answer to where a third grader could understand it. And if he's giving press conferences to where the, the average layman can understand it, best believe when it comes down to these players, he's going to break it down to where they can understand it. And, and that's what I got out of this. Um, fundamentals of football, man. It goes back to the fundamentals of football, and we are going to be right there with it. And like you said, earlier if you thought it was hard under ab it's going to be a lot harder under these new guys because they've got something to prove and they've they've come they're coming with a contract that backs them up so you guys better be ready because we as fans we've been ready yeah and i don't know if this coaching staff knows how hungry this fan base is if they know just how starved we are for winning and how much we're going to be on them if it doesn't work out. But this is actually what Witt had to say about coming to coach here in D.C. You spoke about the 18 years that you put into coaching and that it should not be questioned that you deserve this position here. I wonder, though, what it means to you to have this position, not just as a D.C., but here in the nation's capital. Well, first off, we were just talking about that today, uh, me and Jason Simmons. Um, it's, it's an honor to be in the NFL, okay? All right. Um, there's only 32 of these opportunities. And then to be here with the commanders, um, a team that has just rich history, a team that my one of my best friends, Marcus Washington, played for. Ryan Clark has already said. Um, Sean Taylor is my favorite player. All right. So um, it means a lot to – to be able to be a part of what we're about to do and bring a high level brand of defense. I mean, it's to my core. When I got when I got the job, Marcus called me and said, I know you're gonna have those guys running and hitting like we were. And, and that's what we're gonna aim to do. You got goosebumps earlier. I got goosebumps from that. Not the fact that he mentioned Sean, but the fact that he talked to Marcus Washington and Ryan Clark and these guys, and they believe in him. And they want him to bring us back. I remember, man, when we had LeVar Arrington, Marcus, Jesse Armstead, Jeremiah Trotter, where we had these linebackers. These linebackers were a freaking menace. We have not had linebacker play here for so long. And, I mean, you just just look at the past Super Bowl. I mean, Fred Warner, granted, they lost the game, but you just line, you have to have good linebackers to be successful in this league. And I feel that we're finally going to have – a well-rounded defense that we can be proud of and we can stand behind. And I didn't know a lot about Joe Witt at all. We knew a ton about Kingsbury just because there's a lot of video on him. There's a lot of press conferences on him. But this was the first chance that we as a fan base have had to really hear from him. And I'm impressed. And I get it. It's a press conference. And, I mean, who was a butt fumble? had an amazing press conference here. What the hell is that guy's name? Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez. Great press conference yeah. when he was here. But Joe Wett bringing up Sean Taylor. He didn't bring up Sean for lip service to the fans. He brought up Sean because he respects Sean and the type of football he played. Arriving violent. That's what mm-hmm. Sean did. And Smash if that's mouth. the yeah. kind of D that he's going to bring here, I wish I could put pads on, man. Mm. Ooh. Well, okay. Easy killer. Easy. <laughs> I'll we're stick to pickleball. Keep, there you go. You. We're, we're, we're going to keep you in the pickleball realm. <laughs> we're going to keep you in the pickleball realm. And, and hey, you won't even hear me saying, I want to put some pads on, bro. I, I, I'm i way past that. These these knees of mine have had enough. But uh, I hear the music playing in the background, which I always say lets me know that uh, we're bringing another episode of the DV Mess Hall to a close. And I can't wait to... You guys that hear this and ride with us and ride with us again next week. We'll see you guys on the flip side. Remember, you rep it hard. You don't rep it at all. And with this new coaching staff, they're going to be repping it hard. Mattel Gay Ted, rally captain. We're out.